Great. Uh, we are live now. Um, we'll probably give it just a couple of minutes uh, for people to uh, come in. Um, uh, considering that we've got 45 minutes, um, I don't want to wait too long. Uh, this is an important topic which we are discussing. Um, so I'm going to start with a brief uh, overview of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, wherever you're dialing in from. <coughs> Sorry, whenever you dial in. The topic we have for this panel discussion is envisioning the future of Asia's digital economy. Uh, it's a very big topic. Uh, it's a very important topic considering what is happening in the post-pandemic world. Uh, Asia, as we all know, is a highly fragmented and diverse region. And one of the big opportunities uh, of the digital economy is, sorry, I think I've just got some, is um, it becomes a neutralizer. Uh, so borders disappear. Uh, so what we have today is a very extinguished uh, set of experts from around the world. Um, we have uh, Chevy Bay uh, from Malaysia, who is the founder of uh, BookDoc. Uh, as the name uh, says, it is about finding a doctor, which is very, very relevant to these times. Um, we have Rob Leslie from Ireland, uh, who is the founder of Sedici, which is a identity and privacy solution provider. Um, we have Nad Nadim Buder from Germany, dialing in from Germany, who runs a firm called Just Damn Right, um, which looks at the areas of uh, sustainability and impact in investing. We have Sanjeev Kumar from UK, uh, who runs a very large conglomerate, global conglomerate, DNO, and has been actually driving a lot of digital transformation initiatives for the business. So really look forward to some of the examples you will be sharing. And finally, we have Charles Guyen from Vietnam, uh, who has run various businesses around data and digital. Uh, most recently, he is the founder of Prime Data, which is a customer data platform which enables digital marketing and customer experience at scale. So with that, what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask each of the experts to briefly introduce themselves. And then we're going to organize this session around three key areas, uh, understanding what are the catalysts for growth of the digital economy going forward in Asia. The second is, you know, share some examples of impactful initiatives from your experience in your respective territories. And the third area I want to touch upon is the whole area of inclusivity. As I mentioned, Asia is highly diverse. So inclusivity, inclusivity apologies, is going to be a very important area. So let's start with uh, Sherry. Chevy, if you can kindly introduce yourself and your business. Hi, yeah, my name is Chevy. So I, I'm a founder of BookDoc. So BookDoc is a digital healthcare platform we established in 2017. We're in five countries and 20 cities. So Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Indonesia. So we have north of a million plus users since we are inception. We are also a prof profitable startup, uh, unlike a lot of startups that are not profitable. And yeah, our job is to connect and unite patient and healthcare providers. So from digital booking, telemedicine, running corporate wellness program, digital healthcare, etc. Everything is what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cherry. Um, Rob, if we can go with you next. Uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, Rob Leslie is my name. I'm the founder of, of Sedici, as Arvind mentioned. Um, we're based in Ireland and we're building a platform to help uh, organizations uh, identify reliably who their customers are, but doing this in the context of, of privacy, making sure that there are very tight controls around how the information a person or a company provides is, is stored, is used, is provisioned um, with respect to services that, that are uh, delivered downstream. So it's not a case of I give my data to, to, to us or to, to our customer um, and you, you lose all sight of it and, uh, and control. Um, you're able to see what happens with the information and you're able to permission what happens with that information uh, on an ongoing basis so that if your relationship ends, um, you can you can terminate the connection to the information as well. Uh, so it's one of the things that I think uh, going forward, the world is going to need um, a lot more of, which is visibility over how information is used. So that the transparency factor Um and then also enabling um, how collaborations can be um, put together so that 
greater utility and greater value can be extracted out of data um, for the benefit of, of the person or, or the company who is, who is providing it. Um, healthcare is one of those areas that I think has huge opportunities. Uh, you know, if you were to connect insurance companies to doctors, surgeries, to pharmacies, to, um, you know, general medical companies uh, uh, all over. Um, it just means that the um, the whole horizon starts to improve for everybody because you've got access to more information and to, to drive greater value in the ecosystem. So that's what we do. I'm um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Nadine? Um, sure. I'm Nadine Bruder. I'm the founder of Just and Right, um, based out of Germany. And Just and Right is an international platform backed by an international ne network of innovators, industry leaders, and also um, investors of different uh, types. And we create joint ventures that span sustainability, focused investing, education, and cultures. Um, and just recently, we set up our first um, Venture Partner Program for Impact Startups in India, which is run by women only. And with this program, we look, for instance, into climate technology, um, fintech education, and also legal tech. And yeah, I'm happy to, happy to be part of this panel and look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, Sanjeev? Thank you, Arvin. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'm a product of trial and error, an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, I started my career uh, in Wall Street. Uh, you know, digitalization, I always uh, encourage people to look at our own evolution. Uh, universe went digital billions of years ago. Uh, you know, there is a lot of uh, data mining that uh, nature does. The whole I mean, process of evolution, the way we have produced, is all data coming together and creating human beings, creating all kinds of species. So there is a lot of learning that we need to do ourselves to see how we use data, how we put together uh, the, the learning that nature and universe has already given us. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a lot of things that we have to do. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, our focus on digital transformation has been on a in few areas, uh, starting with health, because we have a healthcare business here in the UK called Harley Street Healthcare Group PLC. And we've seen a, a serious transformation where you had uh, resistance to a, a transformation, digital transformation from clinician. Uh, COVID has kind of fast-tracked that, removed all the firewalls because uh, people have realized that, you know, there is, uh, there is a serious need for digital transformation. So whether it's continuity of care, patient monitoring, uh, uh, as a... Uh, as Rob was mentioning, you know, data, continuity of care, so people have access to their data, they control their data, and also helping uh, using data to help a uh, client. Uh, so clinicians are able to look at the data, whether you're wearing a smartwatch or, you know, any, any of the hardware that you have, running sophisticated algorithm on top of it, and, and you're not and not replacing the doctor, that's where the fear comes in. Uh, it's enabling the doctor. So, you know, the in doctors are making less mistakes. So insurance companies are much happier. Uh, you know, you get more probability. You have more reference point. So that's where we are focusing on. And there are other areas as well on net tech and fintech that we'll be happy to talk about. So, you know, inter looking forward to the, this interesting conversation. Thank you, Sanjeev. Um, Charles? Hi, my name is Charles Nguyen from Vietnam. So I got in uh, technology and MBA from uh, Vietnam and USA. So my, my career is a bit like uh, Sanjeev. Uh, so I hope my life is working with digital technology and, uh, and now data. So since uh, more than 20 years ago, I built a companies in search engine and uh, digital technology for marketing. So my background combined of uh, technology and marketing. That's why as far I, I build uh, two platforms. One is a social listening. Uh, we are number one now in Vietnam and we are extending to the, the Southeast Asia. And the second is right now is um, a prime data is a customer data platform. I have some belief that uh, data is, um, is something wasted for a long time for on the business. People don't have mindset how to use data to maximize it and to understand the customer. 
So um, CDP or anything like that could be the game changer for business to have them enable them to grow for online channels combining with the other traditional channels. So COVID is a situation that it proves everything. So no channel is forever and company have to embrace with omni channels. So that's why we are coming to have them for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so you know, I've been in the area of uh, advising on digital and data innovation for a while now, and uh, all of what you have said touches upon both of these areas, and it's it's critical for the catalysts of how businesses, public sector, startups, all of them, leverage the digital economy. And all of you touched upon in some form or another healthcare, which is very topical with the pandemic. And what to me is interesting when I look at the whole area of data and digital innovation is the, the potential of healthcare to be beyond um, uh, diagnostic as what, looking at the whole area of prevention. Right? And I think this is where the right to play of businesses are immense. Uh, it's not just about healthcare providers. Uh, you know, Adidas, for instance, is in some form responsible for people being healthy. So, you know, they have an interesting right to play when it comes to prevention. Uh, so with that, you know, one of the areas I wanted to start thinking about and uh, get your views on is um, what could be the catalyst? Obviously, the pandemic in itself has been an interesting catalyst uh, for digital transformation in this sector. And um, what do you think are the key catalysts for the growth of the digital economy in Asia going forward? Um, so if I can just, you know, start with uh, Sanjeev. Um, Let me, yeah, sorry. So still figuring out the, the technology thing. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think uh, Asia will drive technology. I mean, digital transformation in Asia will mostly be driven by necessity. And necessity is the mother of invention, right? really. So if you look across Vietnam, Indonesia, we have businesses uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and you see the, the type of uh, innovation that is coming out is unbelievable. I mean, it's completely unbelievable. And nobody has an MIT training or nobody has gone to some amazing uh, AI lab. They're coming up with some serious innovation. Uh, and they're cheap innovation, meaning, you know, it's not, you know, it's not costing them tens of millions of dollars uh, in the R&D lab. So my assessment based on where I see the society going is, uh, adaptation is uh, digital adaptation transformation. This is what businesses are doing anyways. Uh, you look at the access to smartphones is growing uh, year on year across Asia, uh, whether it's the subcontinent, whether it's Southeast Asia, any, anywhere across Asia. You see the, the penetration of Internet, smartphones, etc. Uh, is, is growing significantly. Now, uh, we are, when you, when I'm interacting with, let's say, our partners in Asia, whether they are in uh, a financial space, whether they're in healthcare space or at tech, uh, what I see is they already have a very strong digital strategy. Meaning, you know, even if they are smaller companies, I've been very surprised that they already have a digital officer and, and, and some of them are confused what digital transformation is but they know that their customers are on their smartphones. So they need to access that smartphone. If they want a piece of the revenue, they need to be on that smartphone. They need to be there as an app. So everybody is coming up with some, sorts of, some sort of app, uh, whether it's uh, any sector, uh, you know, sector-related business, they're, they're figuring out how to access that customer. And, you know, they're seeing, uh, if, for example, Marketing is mostly social uh, social media based now. Nobody's going and advertising in newspaper and things like that. So you are already seeing uh, uh, the transformation on, on, on that front. So what I see is the society is also getting ready more and more. I mean, you have uh, a lot of user. I mean, you look at uh, the growth of gaming in Asia. Uh, it's, it's exponential. So the society is heading in that direction. Uh, the businesses need the businesses understand that they need to go there as well, uh, and necessity is uh, is key. Uh, you, you, 
so you know you you, you see the government policies uh you know so there is a lot of inefficiency in asia and i think that's where uh, technology is helping uh jump over all the hurdles that the governments are facing so policy delivery governments are able to use technology to deliver these policies able to monitor them able to supervise them Sorry, and collect real time data uh which which was, wasn't possible 5 10 years ago so government also realized across the across asia a government realized that okay they need technology so i think society and the governments uh are using technology yes there is a flip side to it some governments are without naming names some governments are using uh digital transformation to keep a tap on the citizens so that's there, there is that also but i think i think going forward there will be a lot of growth in the asian market so that's that's my assessment of it thank you sanjeev i think uh, important point you raise on you know obviously what's happening with consumer and their adoption of digital uh, technologies which becomes the catalyst important catalyst for businesses you know there's no way they can sit behind um with that comes the challenges of data and privacy uh, so if i can just uh, get on to you rob uh so while all of this is happening a great news but um there are some pitfalls uh, what are your thoughts on no oh, absolutely there, there 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 are there are big issues that need to be considered in in all of this um you know sanjeev touched on it that, that there are some countries who see an opportunity to you know in, in, enhance their surveillance of of activities within uh, within their economy um and i i think it's very careful uh, we need to be very careful as a society, as a society generally um to to balance the needs to maintain security um you know of the population at large with the opportunities that the the population need as well to to grow and and improve their lives um i i very firmly land on the side of of the individual um in this to be able to control how they do certain things um it, it should be a, a choice i mean privacy ultimately at the end of the day is about choice it's do i want to give my information to somebody else um and when when you don't have a choice meaning you have to give it to somebody else um that's when you've lost your privacy um and it's not just governments that we need to be concerned about it's it's big data uh, big companies um you know the 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 alibabas the ten cents the googles the amazons the the apples where we have an aggregation of data we have a serious aggregation of power as well because with that data comes power and um in the wrong hands and used in the wrong way it can cause immense damage um so so making sure that we've got breakpoints um in the system that allow um controls to be switched on and off uh, as necessary i think um is going to be very very important legal um legal constraints i think are going to play a very very important part um you know when you think about how slow um countries are to um put into place laws and and sort of regulatory frameworks it is quite amazing to think that nearly 70% of the world's economies um will have put in place privacy legislation since 2016 um so between 2016 and roughly 2023 we'll see 70% of the world's countries having legislated for privacy Uh, which is light speed in 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 you know country terms when you think about it. um i've never seen anything roll out as quickly as this ever um which says to to me that this is something they're very very concerned about um making sure that power doesn't leak into the hands of uh, organizations that um you're not 100% sure they will use it for the right purposes so um it touches you know financial services healthcare um transportation everything um in terms of how the data can be used so um it's something that we need to pay very very close attention to because it will determine ultimately the success or failure of um how uh, digital is used uh, going forward uh very important points rob you know i think the whole um, europe in some ways um, has been ahead of the curve with gdpr uh, and a lot of the regulations they're placing 
Um, I'd like to now, you know, uh, ask uh, Chevy as well as Charles, because you both are in the front lines of actually using customer data for your respective businesses. Um, and Asia is very different when it comes to regulation and how it is implemented. Um, so if I can start, Chevy, with you first, uh, because healthcare is very topical and I'm sure there's a lot of sensitive patient data uh, in your platform. Uh, what are your thoughts on data privacy and how you manage it uh, on your platform? Yeah, uh, so yeah, data is a big thing. So not only do we need to comply with the PDPA in Malaysia, we also comply with GDPR. So on our platform, because we have multinational where they have employees globally, one of our clients, like Petronas, is the one of Fortune 500 company from Malaysia. So they are our clients. So we need to be up to bar to where the GDPR is, for example. Then working with insurance company, we work with a bunch of them from AXA to AIA, etc. Then we need to also comply to the insurance regulatory and all these privacy notices. So and healthcare is very regulated, unlike a lot of other industries. So. I think healthcare is among the number one uh, most regulated industry in the world, if you look at it, because you're dealing with people's life uh, and the privacy is a, a big thing, like I mentioned earlier. So we also take our privacy and we also have to do this very frequent pen tests, uh, cybersecurity tests, etc., to make sure that everything is up to speed. Yeah. That's good, Sean. Uh, one question I have is, do you see consumers being uh, conscious about the privacy and their data, are they concerned? Is that a barrier in how your business is growing? So I think five years ago it was, and now because of COVID, everyone had to scan where they go everywhere. So because of that regulation shift, so everyone is more open to like my platform, pre-COVID and post-COVID, we, we have garnered additional uh, close to a few hundred thousand new subscribers and revenue just multiply five times, you know, five X um, because of the market and then it necessitates that they don't do a uh, physical, they do everything digitally. I see. Okay. So that is good news for you then. Yeah. Um, that's good. Uh, so moving on to Charles, uh, what are your thoughts? You know, again, you, you have different data sets which you work with uh, and you mentioned social as well. Uh, people are very conscious about what information they post publicly and how that is being used and either for marketing or you know even surveillance of their own I, i've heard rumors about how even recruitment now is looking at people's social profiles and what they do on social so okay. what are your thoughts and how do you manage the whole area of data privacy in your cdps yeah uh, so so at first let's let me distinguish between uh, <clears throat> cdp and social listening right so CDP is a SaaS platform or it's a software platform, right? It, it, it built and it, uh, used by separate companies. So customer from different company will be stored in different way, in different, uh, isolated, uh, stories, right? So the matter of, uh, data privacy is the, we can, we can think from different layer. Uh, actually in, uh, marketing and advertising field, as you know, data is a very crucial part for the brands to engage with the customer in a meaningful way, right? So actually, uh, in, in marketing field, data had been stored for a long time. It uh, divided into three kind of data. First party data, which means the company or the customer in the company. The second party is from the partners. And the third party data is from the other channels, platforms. So right now, uh, many uh, platform and vendors and, and, and manufacturers like Apple, they already have very strict policy in getting permission from the user for accessing and using data, right? So we look at the data, we look at how to get the data, how to store the data, and how to use the data in the actions. Every step, we need to have the consent from the customer, from the user, right? So consent management is important. We have to comply with that in terms of storing data and interacting with data. For example, like if we can store the data to understand the customer is another side. But if we want to use it to reach the customer, to reach the user at, a, at, at some time, we have to have another kind of consent, right? So in marketing field and advertising field, it has now very strict requirement for that. And uh, for CDP, we build for each company. So uh, they have their own data 
and it's mostly uh, first party data, the data of the customer who really gives them the access in order to get back with the relevant offers. So that's a very good uh, relationship between two sides. For our social listening is is the other platform, right? It it is constrained and, and managed by Facebook, so or the other social media platform. So all the vendors have to align with the accessibility po- policy provided by a platform. We we know we are no exceptions. So, so um, for now, uh, social listening just can analyze public reactions to some kind of topic content, and more and more it narrowed out to the brand channel of the company, right? So I am a Pepsi. I just know how people react to my pen, fan page, right? And all my topic, or my content. So I know and I take care of them. I cannot see from the other, you know, private channels. So that's the theory. Yeah. So in, in short, we have to comply with the consent management and we have to have the, the user permission for each day of uh, dealing with data from getting the data from storing data and for action on the data. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. And I think, yes, there is, it's still, I think, is early stages in terms of consent management. There's a lot of gray area, especially when it gets to third party in terms of what is the level of consent management. And the whole area of how businesses are looking at data and privacy is becoming an important filter for how partners engage with them and investors engage with them. So, Nadine, I'm going to come to you now just to get your thoughts on um, what is the importance of this area of data and privacy when it comes to the whole area of uh, impact investing and also largely sustainability, uh, which is all about numbers uh, and best practices. Uh, Yeah, thank you. So with data privacy, I would love to just uh, mention because everything that you have said, uh, I don't want to repeat. This is something we can uh, also observe here in Europe, um, specifically in e-commerce and other social media platforms that are used um, by companies and individuals. But what we also see here uh, in Europe is that uh, decentralized systems are actually emerging. with the vision to have more equitable systems in place for societies so that um, people are really at center uh, stage and that they are empowered to decide, for example, with whom to share their data with um, and also to have more equal value creation for everyone participating in a system uh, with regard to competition and also revenue. So this is what I find very interesting um, because as Rob Uh, was mentioning, um, it's really like the more uh, data you can generate and it's centralized, the more power you have. And uh, we all know that those stories of of big companies, um, yeah, just kind of seeking uh, the best selling products uh, in in, on the market and then copying uh, themselves. And the other catalyst, um, I think, is very much the ESG regulations or are the ESG regulations um, and speaking of ESG means environmental, societal and also the corporate governance um, policies in place, right? Like how you um, set up the policies with your um, and regulations with your suppliers and uh, with your employees in general. And the adoption and the measurements um, of the ESG um, regulations almost um, in place. That's becoming very critical, I think, because it also, it's not, it's like almost mandatory because it's a necessity uh, to change uh, the systems in place and also um, help soften the climate crisis in that sense. And it's going to be um, also something where I think competition can be um, created in in the long run. So I think um, for the Asian regions, it will be affected, not much 
uh, it is not much so affected by ESG measurements now, but it will be very soon, I think, because it's all about um, providing, again, like a transparent uh, data set um, globally to compare the regions, how they are performing, and then uh, collectively deciding um, about how to engage with the climate crisis and all the effects um, stemming from the climate crisis on a social and economic level. Right. Thank you, Nadine. I think you, you raised an important point about uh, inclusivity and the whole area of uh, importance of ESG. Uh, one of the big catalysts for the digital economy is the SMB sector, uh, the small business sector. There's a lot of the talk around ESG is, I feel, slightly skewed towards the large corporates and their um, outlook and uh, how they hardwire them into their accounting practices. Uh, and the investor relationships. Uh, what are your thoughts on, you know, the small business and especially the startups? How can they start thinking about ESG? Um, it, it's very interesting because here, for instance, in Germany, I have a lot of uh, people approaching me. We have or we struggle with finding young talents because they complain we are not sustainable enough. So that as a corporation, we don't do enough uh, for the environment or for inclusivity in general. And that's where everyone should be alert, no matter the size of the company, because it's all about talents. Money you can get everywhere, but in the end, if you want to create a, a startup, it's all about talent in the end. So the more or the sooner you start um, thinking about what can you do already as a startup to um, put into place specific um, corporate governance uh, structures and KPIs and uh, to, to grow or let have them grow uh, according to your business um, while you're growing and then have more investors coming uh, to the table. That also provides you an advantage because uh, you create and provide transparency so that you minimize the risk for uh, investors because they understand exactly you're concerned about those issues, you uh, think about those uh, issues, you have them in place and you know how to scale them or how to scale the business according to the ESGs and vice versa. So it's, it's a win-win situation for the startup that's uh, looking for investments but also for the investors themselves. Thank you, Nadine. Um, just on the topic, Sanjeev, you know, obviously at DNDO, uh, large conglomerate, lots of businesses across Asia. Uh, what is your views on how you look at ESG as a parameter on uh, selecting businesses to invest or even um, looking at how you partner with businesses here in the region? So I think it's uh, it's an important part of our, I mean, I would say a key part of our business decision and our business thesis. So it's not just the, the uh, it's not just the right thing to do in terms of the principle. It's also a profitable thing uh, to do from our side. Uh, so, you know, so our approach is more focused on business because you're not just doing it because, well, well this is the right thing to do and let's just get some brownie points and all of those things. Uh, we are seeing uh, evidence after evidence that this it works for our business. This is this is a profitable uh, area to get into, uh, and our shareholders are happy. Otherwise, you know, uh, it all comes down to why are we doing it? Is it profitable venture for us or not? Uh, so we are seeing the consumer change, right? We are seeing consumer is driving the entire change. If you're looking at the younger generation. Uh, they are going to interact with companies uh, and they want to see how you behave in the society, right? So if you are investing more on greener economy, they want to see that. It's not just that you come in and talk about it and go home and thank you very much. They don't want sound bites. And when we are doing it on the ground uh, and we are talking about, for example, whenever we are looking at a, an acquisition, I want to see... Uh, that there is an element built in of social impact, uh, environmental impact, uh, because for us, that's part of our DNA now. We just don't want to look the other way. We are not going to be investing in uh, businesses that are going to become redundant five, 10 years ago, because let's face it, we have to be uh, ahead of the curve. 
Uh, if you look at the old economy business, for example, mining, et cetera, coal, et cetera, uh, there is no point. We, even, we won't even speculate in them uh, because I know uh, we have to position ourselves. We have to be forward looking. And if you're a forward looking business, you just have to look forward. You just have to find the opportunity. Uh, and the profitability starts coming in. The valuation starts coming in. Different types of shareholders want to talk to you. And most importantly, uh, you, you build the trust with your customer. So we have different businesses across, as you said. Uh, and uh, if we are saying something and if we are doing something else on the ground, uh, our customers can, I mean, these days, uh, you know, you can get an email from anybody on the street, even if you're a CEO of a company, they will just tell you off and they will post that on the social media. So we have to be very, very careful about what we do. And and on the data side, what I think personally, uh, whenever I am talking to our team, I think uh, we need to understand that as long as if we are using people's data, I mean, first of all, they need to be uh, they need to be uh, assured and reassured that we are using it and handling it uh, uh, in the right way. I mean, every industry has issue. Uh, healthcare industry is overly regulated uh, and we have serious issue. But, you know, in, in any industry across that we have uh, per, or companies in, there is their issue. Now, I am looking at I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can change the conversation by going to the customer and saying, look, why don't we uh, kind of reward you with the data that we are holding? Right. So there can be a monetization aspect of it. And when you talk about monetization aspect of it, I mean, Google is doing that, monetizing people's data. I mean, Facebook is doing that, monetizing people's data. And we are saying, look, you know what? Why don't we share something from with you? I mean, we've done, I mean, example, I'll give an example. So what we do sometimes we have, we have a lot of data on people. What we do is on, a, on, on their birthdays, we will send them a gift, for example. Right. I mean, you know, a nice gift here and there. A lot of people just come back to us and say, wow, that was an amazing gesture. But, you know, in a way, they feel that we are doing something with their data. So we are able to reward them. And then we, are, we want where we want to go is transition towards monetizing that data where they feel that they are getting something back. I mean, it won't hurt our profitability if uh, if we know from the data that we are collecting that they would like to go on a holiday somewhere or they will want a dinner on a birthday with their partner. I mean, if it is costing us 150 pound and it's not hurting our profitability from the customer, I don't mind giving that as a voucher to the customer and say, you know, this is on us because, you know, you give us your business. We hold your data. We have made some money from you. You take something back. I think my my assessment of it is I think customer is open to that idea. Right. Yeah. I think having a good value exchange is important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, time flies, and I noticed we have seven minutes left. So what I'm going to do is just to you know wrap up this session. And obviously, one of the things with the digital economy is there's a lot of new technologies which is coming into place. Right? So obviously, you have AI, which is becoming very prominent. You have blockchain. You have NFTs, which are now looming on, and people are making lots of money on. And there is blockchain, which is being talked about virtual reality, the metaverse, etc. What I'm going to ask each of you is uh, if there was one technology which you believe is very important for your respective businesses going forward, what would that technology be? Um, just one technology so that, you know, which is most, most pressing for you to build capability within your businesses for building the future. Uh, so, Rob, if I start with you, so for me, I mean, Nadine touched on this, um, decentralization and the empowerment of communities, I think is going to be really, really important. Um, I think we're going to see uh, an evolution in, in blockchain. Um, blockchain is right at the beginning and, you know, it's, it's quite inefficient today. It, it consumes, a lot of them consume a lot of energy. Um, but I think... Um, within the next one, two, five years, we're going to see um, big shifts and improvements in the efficiency of, of blockchains generally. Um, they'll become faster, they'll become cheaper, they'll become much more efficient. And what I think that is going to do um, is going to create opportunity for 
financial inclusion, for all kinds of inclusion, um, for, for people that cannot participate today in sort of the real world economy. Um, and through a very, very low cost device, they, their phone, um, they will now have an opportunity to participate um, that previously wasn't open to them. Um, so I, I think blockchain is, is right at its early stages. Uh, I think it will evolve. I, and I think, you know, throw in a little bit of AI in there as well. Um, uh, and uh, it, we'll end up with something that will be really, really powerful. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Uh, Sherry, uh, what's one piece of new technology which is important to your business? I think blockchain is an uh, important one for the privacy of the patients. So I think that is a big key part because privacy, as I mentioned, healthcare, you know, healthcare data is like a gold mine, you know, for a lot of insurance company. So how you want to protect yourself from the robbers who are coming in to rob you guys? That's a good point. Very good. Um, what about you, Charles? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> for me, you know, <clears throat> AI and ML usually uh, have been expected too, too much, but uh, have not been playing uh, the real role, you know, in the real world. So for, for what I expect is a recommendation would be have to be the best, have to be very good so that customer and people will receive what they really want to receive, but not something, you know, crappy and cram things like that. Yeah. So machine learning based recommendation would be one of the key technology for uh, now and in the future. Okay. That's good. That's good. Personalization, depersonalization. Yes. Industry. Okay. That's good. Uh, Nadine, um, like in a broad area with you, what, what do you see in <laughs> All the investing, what technology are investors placing big bets on? Uh, well, it's all about AI and also uh, the next generation of blockchain because what we see now is just, again, like what Rob said, uh, the first iteration and it has to be better um, to be sustainable on, on different levels. Um, but when it comes to sustainability at large, I think like there are so many data points still missing. So I would love to uh, see much more companies uh, trying to tackle exactly that gap, that existing gap. Like how can you create the data points that are needed uh, to then fully understand the different impacts on different uh, industries and different regions? Um, also blended in with climate science. Um, we have just, um, in, in Europe, there was a huge report and also the, the COP26 uh, report was such a huge uh, uh, um, science behind it. And I would love to see more of those innovations happen because then it really um, helps the, the global economy. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Very, very important points. Uh, and Sanjeev, uh, what about you? DNO Group, what's the big tech which is keeping That's you That's a with? very tough one to answer, really. Sometimes we just get too ahead of ourselves. We bet on the wrong technology. And, and so I, I really, I, I would really uh, not be able to give you, I mean, I could give you my personal assessment of it. Uh, but, you know, everybody has a, a, uh, you know, a track record of getting it wrong, completely wrong. I mean, blockchain was completely hyped up. It was revolutionized things. And we are seeing the, the limitation. Uh, you know, we are seeing all the NFTs. We are seeing all the cryptos. We will see a lot of transformation. Uh, our job as an entrepreneur is to see, uh, you know, the aftermath of it. Uh, because when you're seeing the aftermath of it, you can kind of understand where things will go. Uh, so uh, I do see a lot of scope uh, on uh, predictive AI. Absolutely, yes. And things are changing. I mean, we are seeing changes in that as well. Uh, you know, uh, and, and again, where you're using AI is very, very important, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's very important for us. Uh, I mean, different areas of our business, we feel... Uh, uh, will create different value for AI. So if you, you talked about, uh, you know, we are focusing a lot of our learning on automation, AI, on primary healthcare, prevention, et cetera. 
so and, and it's it, it is becoming more more as 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 we invest more money in it and as uh as the product evolves and as the algos get more more better uh you were saying that in healthcare it's it will work i mean i'm just saying in 5 10 year the healthcare transformation will be completely different uh because of ai you're seeing apple watch you're seeing all kinds of wearable devices and what we are doing on top of that is putting in sophisticated uh algorithms that are ai and they are helping clinicians they are helping the customers uh the other thing is uh, again you're using ai in uh, in cyber security i mean uh, cyber security is being transformed using ai because at the end of the day people are now realize that you could be you'll be google you'll be hacked you can be us us government you'll be hacked you'll your nsa you will get hacked so again on 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 cyber security i think uh, again cyber security the way you uh you protect yourself is changing and there 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 are things that uh uh people talk about if i had to put money though if i had to put money uh on something that will make uh you know a trillion dollar business one day uh i would be going with quantum internet i would be going with quantum computing and all of that but right now i just i don't feel that confident that we'll be putting in millions of dollars i mean we're leaving it to google etc uh to do that but we will we are keeping an eye on it uh you know we are keeping an eye on it but that is definitely the big uh the, you know that will that is going to be creating the new teslas of the world uh the new amazons of the world if you get it right uh i think uh quantum computing quantum internet and all of those areas are big areas for anybody to focus on but it it's a long term play it's not uh, a five year play or six year play it's a long term play what yeah, very good insights sanjeev thank you very much i i think it's a great discussion we've had i think if i could just summarize some of the key areas of focus for the digital economy to take care of uh, we spoke a lot about data and privacy uh, which which needs to be you know really buttoned down uh, in terms of how it is managed and um, we spoke about sustainability and esg you know, that that is increasingly important for the younger generation but obviously with cop26 and everything else happening uh, it is not just something which is good to have it has become a bigger necessi- necessity and and particularly you know what rob references the next generation blockchain uh, there's been a lot of hype there's been a lot of talk uh, but this is the time where you know you start looking at how these things can be made real um, and ai and ml is uh, been accelerated in terms of you know how it is being implemented uh i think five years back uh, there were a lot of theoretical case studies but now when i go around looking at how businesses are using ai and ml for obviously driving internal efficiency automation as well as new growth identifying new customers so its personalization the opportunities are immense um but i always like to refer to ai as uh, augmented intelligence because it is the human plus machine uh it, a lot, lot of the talks which i give her on ai focuses on this whole area of um because there's a lot of scaremongery going on on ai taking away jobs and replacing humans etc uh is yes, some of that is happening within sectors uh but the smart players are looking at it as how they can augment the human potential you know i remember seeing a hsbc ad some time back which said that uh there is nothing about human intelligence which is artificial uh, i think that's a very important point when you look at you know the future of the uh, digital economy and how we as a human race embrace it uh, so thank you very much for all of your time we've kind of gone a couple of minutes later which means you know the session got cut off and we are allowed to keep chatting um we lost uh, uh, chevy for a bit but he's come back now so uh, thank you very much i really enjoyed the discussions i think for five minutes these are some great points i i look forward to staying in touch wishing you all a great day ahead thank you arvin thank you everybody thank, thank you everyone. so much nice to meet you bye bye nice to meet you have a great weekend everybody thank you so much thanks for <laughs> a good weekend bye bye, bye.